Hello, and welcome to this short lecture from the History Teachers Talking Podcast. I am Peter Zablocki. My fellow history teacher and best friend Tom Reska and I co-host full-length episodes of History Teachers Talking Podcast, but we decided to supplement the longer episodes with these short lectures that will be brought to you by either myself or by Tom and dispersed between our regularly scheduled topics and conversations. This week, on History Teachers Talking Short Lecture, we'll look at a retirement and death of one particular president. So... Ever wonder what happens to presidents once they retire? I did. It was Wednesday morning, March 4th, 1801. John Adams was defeated. It was not just because he just became the first president in the history of the nation to lose a re-election bid. It was not because he lost the friendship of Thomas Jefferson that would highly likely never be regained. It was not because his own party chose to follow Alexander Hamilton instead of him. It was not because his countrymen failed to stand behind his fight to prevent a war with France that the nation could not win. It was because of all of it. The man with one hand on the handle of his coach and the other on his pocket watch looked back at the presidential mansion one last time. He sighed, turned towards the inside of his carriage, and got inside. The journey back home to his farm and his beloved wife would be both a burden and a relief. The best way to describe the first years of John Adams' retirement is calling it what it was, a self-imposed isolation. For the first two years at his farm in Quincy, Massachusetts, the former president hardly left his house, and if he did, only for brief strolls around his land. Furthermore, in comparison to his later verve for writing and publishing, the early years were very quiet. Adams was 65 years old, and at the time he returned home, well past the average age of a male, where there was only 10% chance for a man of his age to still be alive. John would live to the age of 90, having one of the longest post-presidential retirements of any president. It was a combination of the end of Jefferson's presidency and the political rise of his son, John Quincy, that propelled the elder statesman to re-enter the public arena once again, albeit this time with his pen. Beginning in 1809, Adams began a long relationship with the Boston Patriot newspaper, where he published letters vindicating him from the public character attacks by Alexander Hamilton in his October 1800 letter concerning the public conduct and character of John Adams. It did not matter that the accused had been long dead. Adams saw it as a closure to finally defend himself from what he called the greatest of all liars. From that point on, the writing never ceased which now accounts for volumes of correspondence. It appears that no topic was too trivial, whether it would be discussing the nature of his manure piles at the farm or commenting on history and political philosophy. His most extensive correspondence was between himself and Benjamin Waterhouse, who founded the Harvard Medical School, Benjamin Rush, and eventually his once lost friend Thomas Jefferson. Their once close friendship had turned sour when the two found themselves running against each other for president in a campaign that saw some terrible mudslinging and character attacks that would eventually become the norm of presidential elections. When in 1812, a mutual acquaintance reintroduced the two friends, it spurred on an exchange of hundreds of letters. The topics were all over the place and dealt with the past, the present, and the future of history, philosophy, as well as farming. Although they would not see each other in their retirement, Jefferson and Adams' 14-year correspondence shows forgiveness and redemption for both men. It also shows the ability of two people to remain close friends, regardless of their political affiliation and beliefs. Apart from writing, Adams finally had time to pursue one of his favorite passions, reading, collecting, and annotating books. By the time of his death, his home library had over 3,000 books and was always on the lookout for more. In fact, once his penchant for collecting became known, it became the go-to gift for the former president from everyone ever making a stop to Quincy. Adams began and ended his day in the same study on the second floor of his home where he would wake up early to write and retire late to read. He would often creep out of bed before dawn and read his books by candlelight as not to disturb his still very much asleep wife. When too tired, he would often engage Abigail to read to him once she was up or when the two were about to retire to sleep. Writing to her son and future president, John Quincy Adams, Mrs. Adams openly stated, Your father's zeal for books will be one of his last desires which will quit him. It was not just the reading, but the note-taking that the once most powerful man in America engaged in. Reading a book was like a dance. The narrative would lead and then Adams would take over, pen in hand. 
In his Pulitzer Prize-winning work, David McCullough pointed out how for John Adams, commenting in the margins was like having the ability to have a conversation with himself, to talk back to, agree, or take issue with Rousseau, Turgot, or Adam Smith, or Joseph Priestley. In fact, sometimes it seemed that the margins of his books contained more writing than the text itself, as was evident in a book about French Revolution where the comments totaled over 1,000 words. Apart from reading and writing, Mr. Adams was in his retirement first and foremost a family man. With John Quincy managing his finances and the upkeep of his property, his other son Thomas moving back home to start a law practice, and the widow and children of his late son Charles deciding to also come back, the elder statesman enjoyed his time as a father and a grandfather. Yet, eventually, three tragedies between 1811 and 1818 would leave him lonely, albeit with his books and correspondence. First came the death of his daughter from breast cancer in 1811, then the death of his grandchild to whooping cough, and one from which he could never fully recover, the death of his beloved wife Abigail Adams on October 28, 1818. Succumbing to typhoid fever, Abigail's departure left John distraught. If anything, it slowed him down. His son Thomas and his wife and children moved in to help take care of Adams, not that he thought he needed taken care of. He took his role as a father and a grandfather of 14 grandchildren and five great-grandchildren very seriously and with much pride. In the last five years after his wife's passing, the former president often complained of aches and pains but refused to become dormant. He still rode his horse around the farm at the age of 85 and rambled over the farm or his walks about town which sometimes saw him covered three miles. He also enjoyed his time speaking to and sharing stories with his grandchildren running around his house. In 1820, he even found enough strength to attend the Massachusetts Convention for which he was elected as a delegate. By the following year, with his health deteriorating, particularly his vision, the old gentleman gave a faint speech to the 200 West Point cadets that visited his home while touring the area. It did not matter that he was weak and tired. The president managed to shake every soldier's hand as they came up to his porch one by one. On a stop back at his father's home in 1824 amidst his own presidential campaign, the 57-year-old John Quincy Adams remarked about his father, His sight is so dim that he can neither write nor read. He cannot walk without aid. He bears his condition with fortitude, but is sensible to all that is helplessness. His observation spurred the young Adams to convince his father to pose for what would be his final portrait by the artist Gilbert Stuart. A year prior to his death, another visitor who made it to Adams' study, where he would spend the last months and days of his life in his beloved chair, remembered the balding man's white hair and his near blindness. It would not be long. In fact, once his son was elected president, the elder Adams admitted to probably never having the opportunity of seeing his son again for the younger one would be too busy to visit before the old one expired. Lucky for both, they did manage to meet once more before John's death in 1826. With the national fervor of the 50th anniversary of the nation's independence just days away, two great friends and original creators of the Declaration of Independence were fading fast. In a story that transcends the odds and probabilities, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams held on just long enough to see the day. They both died on July 4th, 1826, 50 years to the day of the signing of the document for which they were credited. By July 1st, 1826, John was too weak to sit in his favorite armchair and would spend more time in his bed. Those around him prayed and hoped that the man would live to celebrate the momentous occasion. Having collapsed while trying to get to his reading chair on the morning of July 3rd, Adams was moved to his bed where he would spend the last hours of his life. Too weak to speak, he often held on to his family's members' hands as a sign of communication when they came to in to see him. On the night of July 3rd, the family physician checking in on the 90-year-old president concluded that he would not live a day and ordered the current president notified. When the night was turning into day, Adams was moved as to make him more comfortable in his bed when he awoke. Upon being told that it was the 4th, he feebly spoke, It is a great day. It is a good day. As the day progressed, and the man's breathing was becoming shallower with each passing hour, he moved slightly, waking himself. Without opening his eyes, John Adams, the second president of the United States, whispered, Thomas Jefferson survives. Unbeknownst to him, his friend and political opponent had died just a few hours earlier, also on July 4th.
While historians generally agree on Adam's final words, McCullough points out that in fact his last words came while struggling for his last breath, when he whispered to his granddaughter Susanna, Help me, child, help me, upon which his heart stopped. Yet sometimes the official end of a story is not as appealing as the perfect, once-in-a-lifetime end that was the concurrent death of Thomas Jefferson and John Adams on the 50th anniversary of the nation's independence. We can all agree that together, these are collectively the last words of John Adams. And that is the truth. Thank you for listening to this Bonus History Teachers Talking Podcast lecture. You can check out our website at www.historyteacherstalkingpodcast.com. Hello, this is Gary Chahot welcoming you to check out the French History Podcast. Our main show covers the history of France from the first humans until present. If you liked Mike Duncan's The History of Rome and wanted a similar program covering the land of beauty, culture, and love, we are exactly that. We also host world-renowned scholars who have delivered guest episodes on their specialties, including 18th century pirates, revolutionary booksellers in 20th century Paris, the special friendship between the Marquis de Lafayette and Thomas Jefferson, and numerous others. Learn what you love and listen to the French History Podcast today.